Again, good morning. Uh, Manila and I uh, share something that we are both uh, given the uh, gift and the curse of perfectionism. And so, uh, but Noah and I also share something that is, it's gonna take a whole lot more than some sound equipment not working for us to praise the Lord. So um, we are again, so excited uh, to be here with you guys this morning. Um, wow, we made it 18 months and we get to crack open our Bibles under the same roof. That is a big deal. Um, we are very excited about it. Uh, 18 months is a long amount of time. Uh, my son, we were driving around the other day, and um, he reminded me that right before um, you know, March of 2020, about 18 months ago, uh, he was about to play his first season of Little League, like real Little League, because we were talking about how um, uh, he had just, we just went to our daughter's volleyball game, and he was saying, Dad, how come they never keep score at our games? Because before that, it was just park and rec, not real games. I was like, we were going to do that. And I started thinking, man, that was a long time. That feels like an eternity ago that we were on the practice fields getting ready to uh, start our Little League season. And uh, literally a week before uh, the season started, they canceled it, uh, obviously, for good reason. But uh, it, that's a long time ago. A lot has changed with Freedom Church. 18 months ago, I was not the pastor of Freedom Church. Uh, things have changed. We had some uh, staff changes and some life changes. Um, but the thing that has not changed is the mission. The mission to make Jesus known in this community uh, of Buckeye. And so, obviously, planting a church two months before a worldwide pandemic is not ideal timing. I don't think they would teach it to you that way, um, if they could. But uh, because of the commitment uh, to make Jesus known by our sending church in Alabama, Northport Baptist and Pastor John Jenkins and the leadership team here in Buckeye, uh, because of their commitment together, again, to make Jesus known in this community, uh, we are here today. Um, and so the question is, um, you know, there, there's a job to do, and we are very excited to be able to get started in that again. Now, the question that uh, racked my mind for the last, I took over as interim pastor first week of July, um, so I've gotten to really rev things up here, um, and the question was, where do we start? Where do we, where, after 18 months of built-up sermons, uh, where, where do you look at first? You know, I thought... We could start by just sort of letting people know who we are, what we're all about, introducing the team and sort of our missions, our values, the things that uh, we're passionate about to kind of know what you're what you're getting into. Uh, and now we're not going to do that. Um, no, thank you. Uh, but we will um, be doing that in a different way. Um, we are going to be uh, putting out in the middle of each month. Um, you know, we'll have service basically the first of each month. In the middle of each month, we will be putting out a web series that we're calling uh, Relaunching Freedom Church. It's a very creative title. And uh, we're going to be putting that out right around the middle of each month. And that's meant to be a web series that kind of gives you some behind the scenes on how we put all this together, how it goes from a trailer to this, um, which we had a great team. That, can we give it up for our team today? We put it beautiful in here. Um, you kind of forget you're in a gym when you kind of come in here um, a little bit. So, um, you know, the, the dangling basketball hoops will bring you right back to it. But... Um, Kind of forget for a moment um, but how we take it from a trailer to this uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that so we're gonna get some behind the scenes but we'll also be kind of giving our missions and values through that web series so that people kind of know what they're getting into ahead of time so you can check that out we just won't uh, be doing that today but we will be doing it at some point um, so what else could we where else could we start well there's been a lot that's happened in the world in the last 18 months um, there are Arguments over facts and, vac and science and fights over masks and vaccines and racial injustice and rioting in the streets, a new president and constant liberal versus conservative banter. My wife is just staring a hole through me right now. And we're not going to talk about that here. You are in the wrong place uh, if you think we're going to take a biblical slant on any of that and be talking about that on a regular basis. That's not 
what we're about. I said we're not going to really go into what we are about as a church today, um, but I can tell you for sure that's not what we're about. That is not what we're about here at Freedom Church. Um, you might be thinking uh, 18 months is a long time. You'd be saying to yourself, hey, 18 months is a long time. I'm sure that comes with a lot of Bible study and reflection, and I'm sure you have, you know, some real, you know, existential words uh, that the Lord's given you that you're just ready to kind of spew out of me. I said 18 months since Freedom Church. It's been close to two years since I've been up in, in front of any kind of audience, any kind of live audience, uh, holding a microphone and preaching. So um, you have to bear with me. At some point, I did grow up in West Phoenix, so I'm hoping I don't go like rapper mode with my with the uh, microphone because I get too comfortable up here. But it's been a while for me. I'm sure, you know, you might be saying to yourself or you're saying, asking that, uh, you know, it's been a long time. The Lord's probably given you a word for people. He's probably ready to speak out. And thank you for asking. Yes, he has um, given me a lot. But even in lieu of that, we are instead going to take a page out of one of the apostles and how we attack our relaunch. And we're going to look at the apostle John. The one whom Jesus loved. Um, John is a fascinating character. Um, and, and history tells us he was the last remaining of the 12 hand-picked apostles of Jesus Christ. Uh, in terms of his time on this earth, he was the last of that. Whereas most of his contemporaries kind of had shortened lives, martyred lives, and he didn't get to live all that long. Um, John actually lived a pretty full and complete life, even after Jesus ascended to heaven. Um, lived to be over a hundred years old uh, when he died. And so that comes with um, a lot of wisdom in a lifetime. And what happened is that John, towards the end of his life, at about a hundred years old, he was being um, shipped from church to church in Asia Minor, uh, which is modern day Turkey, uh, in that area where the church was kind of growing and getting bigger. Uh, John was kind of being shipped from church to church because, hey, we have the last apostle with us. Let's hear him preach. This is really important. He knew Jesus. And so the people would come from all over the area to these services to hear John teach with just great anticipation. This is somebody who walked with Jesus and they were looking for, you know, the real inside scoop, the kind of the behind the scenes stuff, you know, stuff like what was Jesus like when he woke up in the morning? That kind of stuff. You got to hang out with Jesus. Like, uh, did you guys give Peter like a lot of grief for that whole like denying Jesus three times thing? Or um, what I would I would guess if I was if I was me, the question I would ask is be like, okay, dude, John, I know you're like old and I have to respect you and stuff at this point in your life, but uh, like, how dumb did you feel when you and your brother asked? who the Bible calls the literal prince of peace. Hey, is it cool if we burn down this village? Do you think that'd be cool? Like, how dumb did you have to feel? Like, that, those are the questions I would want to know if I was able to spend some time uh, with John. And, and, all, and the people were kind of coming to get, like I said, that inside scoop on Jesus and, and, and what it was like to be around him. And instead, John would make his way up to the front of the church he would, you know, let, let, let everybody sort of lean forward with a, a hurried ear to hear what um, God was going to teach through them. And, and John would just simply say, love one another. Just love each other. No, no inside scoop, no, no existential secrets. Just, just love each other. That Jesus is love and that as he loved us, we should love others. And that was just a simple message that he would go all over saying and so we're going to take a page in that same way here at freedom church that there's so much that we could start off after 18 months of not having in-person services but we're just going to talk about jesus if that's okay with you and who he is and what he is all about so that brings us to the scriptures uh, that john wrote during this time of his life at about 100 years old he penned what we call first john and um so we are going to read the letter of first john and he 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 wrote 1 John for a very specific reason, and that is found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. It should be on the screen for you, but I'm going to read it for you real quick. It says, excuse me, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, 
that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. That phrase, uh, that you may know, um, in the Greek is just one word. It's spelled E-I-D-O, and it's pronounced Ido. And it means the force and meaning of something that has a definite, definite meaning. It's actually the same word, the same Greek phrase that is used throughout Scripture when, when the Bible talks about just somebody seeing something. It's the same word used when they say, I saw a star in the east. When the shepherds saw a star in the east, it's the same ido that's used there in the Greek. It's the same word in, in the Bible when, uh, when Jesus said he saw his disciples fishing on the docks and he asked them, would you like to become fishers of men? It's the same thing. It's, it gives off the, the, the interpretation that it's like there's, there was not something there. And then there is a definite thing there. I saw it. It's right. It's right there. And so when he says that you may know. He's, it's, he's essentially saying, I've written this letter to you so that you may know that you know that you know that Jesus is alive and that through him is eternal life. And so um, John is, is, is saying that in this letter, and for me personally, somebody for me personally, I'm an affirmation, affirmation type of person in school, in work, in my life. I don't know how some of you guys are like really definitive about things like I know this like I'm almost not definitive about anything like I never trust myself enough to say that I know the best way to do really anything I'm not definitive about really anything in my life so st scriptures like this really help me it's okay you can be definitive about this I wrote this letter so that you may know that you know that you know who Jesus is what he's all about and that faith in him is the result in eternal life and at its core first and foremost that's what freedom church exists to do as well we exist for the exact same reason which is to tell the community to tell the world who jesus is what he's all about and that eternal, that faith in him results in eternal life so over these five services uh we're going to study the five chapters of first john that worked out pretty good too right um and so uh, we will have it on the screens here, but as we jump into chapter 1 of First John, um, we have Bibles at the front and the back, or you can open up on a device if you need it. If, if you don't have a Bible of your own, you're welcome to keep that Bible. Just the deal is you got to read it every day. That's, that's the only deal we're going to take. You can take it with you um, if you'd like, but uh, they'll be on the screen if you want to follow along. But I'm going to ask, in reverence of the Word of God, if you all would stand with me, if you can, uh, while we read this first chapter that we're going to study today. 1 John 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of God, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was from, which is with the Father, and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that we also may have fellowship with us. Excuse me. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from Him and declare to you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have, we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated um, this morning. Ten pretty brief uh, verses to make up the chapter But there's really three pretty distinct Messages that John is giving us here in this first chapter And so we're calling today's message LJL life joy and light LJL life joy and light So let's talk about life first by reviewing those first three verses again I'm just going to read them real quick to you that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon which our hands have handled concerning the word of life the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you 
that eternal life, which was from which is with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So, our first talking point today is just this Jesus was and is alive. Jesus was and is alive. John's doing a couple different things in this first portion of scriptures here, uh, in these first three verses. Uh, the first thing is that he's connecting back to what he wrote in his gospel, what, what Heidi read for us during worship. John chapter 1, verse 1, he uses that same word when he says, in the beginning was the word. Um, and that word in the Greek is the word logos. It's the same word he uses here when he calls it the word of life in, in verse 1. So he's sort of connecting back to what he already read. He's essentially saying, hey, that word that I was talking about in John chapter 1, that word that was in the beginning, that word that was with God, that word that was God, his name is Jesus, and I have seen him and I physically touched him, is essentially the message that he's giving here. Why is that important? Well, it's actually really, really, really important. There's two main reasons why it was important. It was important. The Greeks, the main people um, that were hearing this message, that this letter was being written to those Greek people, they they had that initial audience. The word word was the, like I said, the Greek word logos, and and that may not mean much for us. We think logo, and we think of all of these cool school banners that are around the gym. That's a logo, um, but to the Greeks, it had a, a whole different meaning. The idea of logos was something that a good Greek boy or girl at school would have heard about their entire life growing up. Logos was the idea of like the eternal, the, 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 the God, essentially. There was something bigger than you, and they called that thing logos. And so by all of the, philosoph the philosophers, and um, it was really the basis for organization and intelligence in the universe, the ultimate reason, the, the reason for controlling all things in the universe, they refer to that as the Logos. And so John is saying that ultimate Logos that you guys have been hearing about, again, his name is Jesus, and I know him, I've seen him. It's important, it's also been important because at this time in the church, even at this time in the church, it was only like 40, 50 years after Jesus' died. At this time in the church, there was already a false theology that was making its way into the church. There are false theologies that are continually attacking the church uh, um, that Jesus Christ built. And so this one in particular was something known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism essentially meant that uh, it was an admission that Jesus was God, but that Jesus wasn't actually a man. He wasn't actually a human being. He was just God. And the, the reasoning behind that was that God was good, but man was evil. So there's no way that God could be evil or come from man. So yes, Jesus was God, but he wasn't fully man. This is a very dangerous theology. And essentially John was saying this eternal God, he was a man. I saw him. I heard him. I touched him with my own eyes, my own ears was a man. And so why is this important to point out now? Well, first, I think that still today, many of us are looking for that eternal logos. Um, mankind spends a lot of time wondering where they came from and where they're going. We spend a lot of resources on those two questions, and it really makes sense. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. He's placed it in us to kind of not think in terms of just this world, but what comes after it. That, that we were, you know, if you think about the Garden of Eden, we were, not, we were not created as human beings to just spend our 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this earth and then it be done. We weren't created for just that small pocket of time. We were created with a soul that is eternal. And so obviously we're going to continue to think in terms of eternity. So it's really important to know that eternity, eternal life, it's through logos, it's through Jesus Christ, it's through the word, and the message is, is still the same today as it ever was. Again, that eternal that you're looking for, his name is Jesus, and I, I know him, that's, that's still the message 
today that John was giving back then. And then second, the root of Gnosticism still really rears its ugly head today. The reason that Gnosticism kind of fit and became popular in the first place was because Gnosticism essentially takes the blame off of you. Of course I sin. I'm just a dude. Like, I'm just a guy. So I, of course I sin. You can't blame me for that. I can still be good with God. And I can do whatever makes me feel good. That definitely still happens in our society today. But the fact that Jesus was a man and what overcame sin and evil in this world should empower us as his followers to be able to do the same. Additionally, Jesus wasn't some vision or fantasy. He walked, he talked, he joked, he cried, he slept, and he worked. John is saying, I was able to get to know a fellow real human being. I was able to follow him. Because of that, you can too, is essentially the message that John is giving. This fact really makes Jesus stand out and be unique across all world religions. Um, in all other world religions, the characters in those world religions that carry out the religion, um, that, that are the ones here on earth that are doing the deeds of that religion here on earth, there's always a very clear dividing line between those individuals and their eternal God. There is no, there's nobody, there's no in between. Jesus is in both boats. He is both man carrying out the word here on earth, and also God. He is the only one that is in both boats. And as being the only one who's in both the boat of here life on earth and the boat of eternal life in heaven, he is uniquely qualified to pull us from one to the other. And so that's what makes Jesus different than, than anybody else. So let's continue. Let's read uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Man, if that is not so important in our world today. Our second speaking point is Jesus equals joy. Jesus equals joy. John is telling you that if your faith, if, if you have faith in Jesus that results in, in eternal life, so that you can be full of joy. The idea that if, you're, if you have faith in Jesus and you know you can live forever in heaven, you should be joyful. And if that's the case, so many Christians feel so miserable all the time? Or why do so many people who profess to be Christians, things that come from their mouths don't sound anything like joy? Why is that the case if Jesus equals joy? In a lot of ways, joy is a measuring stick for how close you are in your walk with Jesus currently. The more joy that sort of emanates from you, probably the closer you are with Jesus in that moment. I heard a pastor give a really great example of this. One of the first miracles that Jesus um, did was found in John chapter 2. It was uh, when he performed a miracle at a wedding in Cana. It's, um, and it's actually what our Freedom Kids group is, is learning about today. So you can compare notes with them later because we're going to talk about the exact same thing. Um, but it's, it's where Jesus shows up uh, and meets just sort of a few people having a wedding who have run out of wine, and he takes water, and he turns it, excuse me, turns it into wine. And um, so it's not a big area. There's not a lot of people that are there, but there was a need, and he wanted to give some people some joy. The lesson is, is that he, Jesus, will provide for us and our needs, and that he is all about joy. But the question again comes up, if he is about joy, then why don't I feel joy right now? Like, why don't I feel it as we sit here today? I may not be feeling the joy that you're necessarily talking about. And much of this can actually be explained by looking maybe a little bit deeper at the purification process of wine. I have a little setup here. Very excited about my, uh, my uh, showing here this uh, demonstration that we get to do. But essentially, in the purification process of wine, what somebody, what they would do is they would take the crushed grapes um, and they would put them into a vessel here. And when you would crush the grapes and you would uh, pour them in there, what would happen is it wouldn't be just a pure liquid like this is. There would be some what they call dregs or lees in them, which are just sort of the sediment that's left from the, the grape. This is tahine, so we're not going to touch this afterwards. It's not going to be sweet wine, but it does... It, it proves the point here. Um, 
But uh, you can see that what's happening here is the, the it's kind of hard to see from your seat. So let's, let's get our stage camera guy in here to, to give you a better look on the screens. We don't have a stage camera guy. Come on guys, we've been out of this for 18 months. There's no camera guy that's coming up here. But anyways, maybe in the future. Uh, but what's happening here is the dregs, the leaves, the, the sediment of, of it is starting to sort of settle in the bottom. So is the same with wine. The wine would go in and then they would, they would allow it to sort of make its way down and settle all at the bottom. And then at the perfect time, at the perfect time, they would take that vessel here and they would put it into, oh, this is dangerous. They would put it into a different vessel with the goal of leaving. They didn't have, you know, the good, um, the good uh, filtration systems that we have now, but the goal was to leave. You can see there's some dregs in there. And so they essentially filtered out the sediment, filtered out the dregs as they put, went from one vessel to the other. So this is a little more purified than this is. And they would do that over and over and over again until you had the purest, sweetest wine. Because what happens with the dregs, if you allow them to sit, it makes the wine go from sweet, it takes on the taste of the bitter dregs, of the bitter leaves. And so is the same in our life with Jesus Christ. That when we give our, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are literally washed by the Holy Spirit. Our, our, as we symbolize in the form of baptism, where it sort of washes away the old of us and we come out brand new. And we literally are flooded with the joy of Jesus Christ and the washing of the Holy Spirit. We are this vessel that's just poured in with all of us. And then it starts to filter out all the sin, all the grossness in our lives. But in order to continue so that it doesn't kind of stay at the bottom and we don't start to take on the taste of that old bitterness, of that old sinful life, of what the Bible calls the old man, at certain times it's time to change it from one vessel to the other. And you can see these are two very different vessels. That's life getting turned all around, flipped upside down elongated, stretched out, moved. It's not a comfortable process being flipped over into another vessel. And so oftentimes our joy escapes us during the vessel purification process, when our lives are turned upside down because one bad thing happened or another bad thing happened. But what's happening is a purification process is happening because if we don't allow that to do it, if we simply get bitter and we say, I don't want the purification, I've been through too much in this world, I'm tired of having my life flipped upside down and having to stretch and fit into this new reality of my life, I can't deal with this anymore. I'm done with all of that and we allow that sediment to get its way into our lives and to become the taste that is our lives. We make a lot, um, Jeremiah used a really good example of this exact thing in, in uh, chapter 48, verse 11, I have it here on the screen. He was talking about the Moabites and this specific reason. He says, Moab has been at ease from its youth. He has settled on his dregs and, not, and has not emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him and his scent has not changed. I think everyone would agree that being stagnant in this life, that feeling stagnant in this life is never a good thing. And especially in our walk with Jesus. But sometimes it becomes hard being stretched and put into a new vessel, a new reality in this life. And, and that's where the joy sometimes can be suck, sucked out of you. But we have to keep the mindset of this is just constantly a purification process to get me closer to who Jesus created me to be. All right, our final point, you probably guessed it, is Jesus is light. This week, we're going to read the final five verses here, uh, 1 John chapter 1. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I'm going to stop there for a second. We can leave it on the screen, but um, think about that. This right here is the message that john heard from jesus himself that jesus wants told to you to me to the reader 
This is the message which we have heard from him, and we declare it to you. This is the message. What is that message? God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie, and we don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, which his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Again, our final point today is Jesus is light. That message that God is light and in him is uh, no darkness at all is a perfect example of what, again, we want to be about at Freedom Church. The, the, the message is not about me. The message is not about, like, the, 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 book, the newest book that I'm reading. Oh, I heard this. I want to give this message to you from a pulpit. Or the, the newest podcast that I'm listening to. Or the newest program on television that I saw. So I want to give that message out to more people. The message is not about me. Just like John, the message came from the source. And I'm just giving you the message. I don't, I honestly don't understand pastors who speak and don't talk about the word of God. Because why am I listening to you if you're not talking about the word of God? We're not here for self-help. We are here to hear the message that was given to them by God so that we can hear it. So I can speak on a, with authority on the word of God because it's not my message. It's God's message. And so if we say we have, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, where it says we lie. This is such an interesting portion of scripture because it poses the possibility that some may present a false claim that they are in fellowship with God. That means there are people walking around this earth who say that they're in fellowship with God or think that they're in fellowship with God, but John poses the possibility that they're not actually in fellowship with God because there is sin in their life. They are walking in darkness. The, John's essentially saying, the proof is in the pudding, is what, is what John is saying here. If you say that you have fellowship with God, then you shouldn't be walking in darkness. And if you're walking in darkness, you're lying. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, let's talk about this for just a second. We're going to start to close this down. Matter of fact, no, if you want to start making your way up here. This idea of walking in darkness versus walking in light. What does that mean? Does it mean that, that I'm in darkness because... I got into a, an argument or a fight with my spouse on the way to church this morning. Does that mean I'm walking in darkness? No. But if that fight was the result of a continued argument that is based off of a sin in your life that you're not willing to deal with, then maybe it is. The idea of walking in light does that mean that I have to be perfect? That I have to, 100% of the time, never sin in my life? In order to walk in light, do I have to just sort of be like the shiny angel that never, never makes a mistake? No, 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 not at all. The key is to be willing to sort of take a look at yourself and realize that you're in sin. Realize that, that, that you may not be doing it the right way, that you may be walking around this earth thinking that you're in fellowship with God, but there's a sin that's in your life, and a, the most dangerous of sins is when we're not willing to take a look at ourselves and say that we are in sin. When we think we got it all figured out, but that sin is still in us and we are walking in darkness. We often get fooled into thinking that we're not good enough to walk in light, and we're not bad enough to be considered walking in darkness. The truth is, it's not about good and bad. It's about choosing the light of Jesus Christ over the darkness of this world. It's not about if you're good or if you're bad. It's about choosing light over darkness. It's standing up and saying, I believe 
that you died on the cross for me, not only because John saw it and he told it to me, but because I see it now for myself. There's a great story in the Bible uh, right after um, Jesus has uh, been, been um, crucified and buried. There's these two men that are walking from Jerusalem to the next town over. And as they're walking, Jesus shows up with them. And they're like, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they don't recognize that it's Jesus. And they're saying, hey, have you been living under a rock for a while? Did you see all this craziness that's happening in the streets? Dude, we're, we're throwing people up on trees <laughs> to, to kill them. You didn't see all this craziness happening? And so it's, the scripture tells us that Jesus, starting in the book of Genesis, teaches them the word of God. Which is the same way that we're doing right here, except for a lot better because Jesus was the teacher um, than what we're doing right now. But he starts to teach them the word of God. But they still don't recognize that it's Jesus until they have a personal encounter with him when he comes back to their home and he breaks bread with them. He eats with them. And then it says their eyes were opened to who Jesus was. And they said, man, did not our hearts burn with desire when we heard him speak the, 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 the scriptures? But we didn't know who he was. But now we see him, not just because John said so, not just because it's in the Bible, but we've had a personal encounter with him today. Now we see him. Today is our day of salvation. If you're with us this morning and you have not had that day of salvation yourself, if you've not seen Jesus, and maybe for the first time in your life, you are seeing Jesus. It, it, the eyes are open, the light has gone off, and you see who Jesus is. We're giving an opportunity to act on that here in just a minute. The scriptures go on here, as we've just read, to give us one of the greatest scriptures for followers of Jesus Christ, people who are already followers of Jesus. It's in verse 8 and 9. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You may be sitting here this morning hear about, hearing about how you're supposed to have joy as a Jesus follower and you're just not feeling it right now. It, the vessel-to-vessel -vessel purification process has just gotten to you. This, this stretching, this making the new reality in our, in our life is just too much at this point. And I, I don't feel the joy. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's taken a toll on you, and you're just not feeling it anymore. Well, I have good news for you. It's not about your feelings. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is not about how you're feeling that day. Praise the Lord that it's not about us and how we're feeling that day. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ. When he got up on that cross and he said, it is finished, he meant it was all finished. He meant that the, 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 the job that he started in you when he called you on your day of salvation, it doesn't matter how you feel when you woke up this morning, it's going to be finished. It's, he's going to stay with you until it's revealed itself, until it's finished. He's just waiting for you to go through this process, to ask for forgiveness, to be cleansed from all unrighteousness, so we can pick back up on the job that we started. Because your job that he's called you to is not about how you feel today. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ. And all we have to do is ask for forgiveness, be cleansed from that unrighteousness, and we get to pick that right back up. Before we sing and we close our service, I want to give you an opportunity through prayer to be right with God right now. If you're in the, if you don't mind, all in your seats, just bow your head. We're going to start praying here for a second. But if you're in that first camp of, just like the men on the road of Emmaus, you've heard about Jesus. You may have heard scriptures. You've gone to church your whole life. But you didn't know who Jesus was, what he was all about, that he's about life. That he's about joy. That he's about light over darkness. And today, you're seeing him in a whole brand new way. Then I want to give you the opportunity to proclaim him, to declare him. The scripture says, if you declare that, that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Then you will be saved. But it, it requires a declaration. So I'm going to give you that opportunity. If that's you this morning, just throw your hand up real quick so that you can make that with one declaration that Jesus is Lord, that he is life, that he is joy, that he is light. 
Just throw your hands up in your declaration that I agree with that, that he is Lord, that God raised him from the dead so that I can be saved. We see you this morning. Let's, as, in that declaration, I'm going to pray. You pray after me here and, um, and make this with God. Father God, Lord, I see you this morning. I may have heard about you. I may have been thinking that I was walking with you. But now I see you this morning. Father, I ask that you come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. I proclaim that you died on that cross and that God rose you from the dead. And that through you is eternal life. Father, come into my life and save me right now. And if you're in that other camp, it's just not feeling the joy. The vessels to vessel transfer of this world has just got you down. Guess what? We've all been there. I can't say that I haven't been there. It can be really tough times. It's been a tough week. It's been a tough month. Guys, it's been a tough 18 months. And you may be looking at it and saying, wow, who I was a couple of years ago when I, when I heard, when I had that moment that some in this building had just had this morning. When I had that moment, I felt like a whole different person than I feel like right now. I don't feel the joy. Again, it's not about the feeling. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ. And all it takes is a surrendering of your heart saying, that's on me. God hasn't gone anywhere. That's on me that I don't feel that way anymore. And I ask for forgiveness. If that's you this morning, again, in the same way of declaration, just throw your hand up because we're going to pray together and we're going to make that right. Just make that declaration. It's time for me to ask God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I want to get right with you. If that's you this morning, pray with me, Father God. Forgive me. That's the sin, whatever that is, in the back of your mind. This is the hurt, this is the pain that's kept me from being who you've called me to be. And Father, I'm sorry that I let that get in the way of who you've called me to be. Forgive me from that. Cleanse me from that unrighteousness. Let's pick this job back up and let's continue on. Noah's gonna play a quick chorus here as we get ready to close out our service. Um, I invite you to stand to your feet. Many of you have just prayed prayers. I'm going to ask that as we do this last chorus, you may have repeated after me. I'm going to ask you to make that right with God. Now it's not the time necessarily to grab your stuff. We're almost done. I promise after he's done, I'm going to come back. We're going to close this thing down. But stand with us this morning. We're going to sing a quick chorus here. And now's your time to make it right with God. Your words, not mine.